Hey, thank you so much for tuning in. My name is Ray Sweet from First Christian Church in Greensburg, Indiana. As always, you can check us out at FCCGreensburg.com or you can go to the FCC Greensburg Facebook page. But listen, our heart is simply this. We want to get into this word, but most of all, we want this word to get into us and transform these hearts more and more into the image of Christ. Now, there was an elderly lady who loved Jesus with all her heart. You would never know by her grateful and sweet demeanor that she didn't have much. Her only problem was the old man who lived next door. He was cantankerous. He was always trying to prove to her that there was no God. Well, one day as he was walking by her house, he noticed through her open window that she was kneeling in prayer. So he thought he would sneak close and hear what she was saying, and here's what he heard. Lord, you've always provided me with everything I've needed. You know I don't have any more money, I'm completely out of groceries, and my social security check won't come in for another four days. Lord, in your mighty power, will you please, please bring me some groceries? At that point, the man had heard all he needed, so he ran down the grocery store, bought some milk, bread, and lunch meat, drove back, set the groceries on her porch, rang the doorbell, and then he quickly hid next to her house. Now, you can imagine how the woman reacted seeing that bag of groceries. She threw her hands over her head and she began to praise Jesus Pentecostal style. She said, thank you, Jesus. I was without food and you brought me groceries. At that time, the old man jumped out and he said, I've got you now, old woman. I told you that there was no God. It wasn't Jesus who gave you those groceries. It was me. But the woman very boldly said, oh, no, Jesus got me these groceries. And the best part is he made the devil pay for it. <laughs> now, speaking of the devil, welcome back to week four of this series over spiritual warfare called Stand. Feel free to turn in your Bibles to the book of Ephesians, chapter 6. Ephesians 6 is we're very intentionally getting into the Word, training these hearts and these minds how to stand firm against the enemy's attacks. Now, one thing most lead pastors do is try to pray through a preaching calendar that they'll preach for the whole year. For instance, let's say it's October, November of this year. I will be focused on laying out what we're going to study and preach through on Sunday mornings for the year 2025. Of course, we always try to stay flexible. We want to always stay in tune with the Holy Spirit's leading. And listen, that's what happened with this series. This was not in the 2024 plans. But as early summer hit, the Holy Spirit began to convict me and show me that this is an area where believers are often either uninformed or misinformed. We either don't give the enemy uh, enough attention and pretend like nothing's happening, or we give him too much power. And as this plays itself out, it means we can so easily walk in defeat. No joy, no peace, no love, our thinking influenced by the world, giving in constantly to those fleshly desires, and being slayed by the enemy in his attacks. So finally, after the Lord got this through my thick skull, we made the switch. And I'm so thankful we did, because I've heard so many good comments from our church family already about how necessary these conversations are for us in the church. Now, the first two weeks of this series, we talked about standing firm in the power of Christ as we learned about the three enemies that we face, the world, and its system around us that will always stand opposed to God's word, the flesh, those selfish and pride-filled desires that war within us, and even Satan and his demonic army that seeks to steal, kill, and destroy anything that is connected to God's glory. And that includes you and me. Now, last week, we began putting on that armor. And just like Pastor Mitch taught us, the belt held it all together. And for us, it's Christ that holds everything in place. He is the truth. And it starts by making sure that we are walking in Him daily. 
And today we're going to look at the next piece of armor called the breastplate of righteousness. Now this picture doesn't show us, this picture that you're looking at right now, doesn't show us complete view of the breastplate because it's covered by different parts. But it basically went from the neck all the way down to the thighs, even wrapping around to cover most of the back because Satan loves to fight dirty. And basically, its purpose was to protect your vital organs. And while the whole armor weighed up to about 70 pounds or so, a lot of that was this large piece of metal that protected your organs. And while no one wants any organ to be attacked with a sword, what do you think the main organ was that needed to be protected? The heart, right? Now, what do people wear today that basically does the same thing? A bulletproof vest. And I'll tell you, the importance of that vest took on even more significance to me probably over a year ago. Uh, one of my family members is in the military, and without going into any detail, he was stationed overseas close to a combat zone, and on one of their missions, he was shot in the chest. Now, I have no idea what damage that could have done. But the good news was that his vest potentially saved his life, and he walked away simply bruised up and sore. That's it. Could you imagine going into that first century battle with swords and no breastplate? You may be William Wallace, okay? But eventually, something's going to get through, and you're going down. But this breastplate of righteousness, this breastplate guarded your organs. And most importantly, it guarded the heart. You may get bruised up from the impact, but any sword that goes across this area that could take out your heart, it's simply glancing off. And so today, as we look at what this means spiritually, we're going to talk all about the heart. How many of you have heard this phrase, heart healthy? How many of you have been annoyed by this phrase? <laughs> Usually it's those of us asking if bacon fits into this category. And in the words of Michelle Tanner, how rude that every physician just stares at me and won't even answer the bacon question. But we live in a society that is obsessed with foods that are heart healthy, and rightfully so. You see it on packages, you hear about diets that are heart healthy, and that's okay because it's important to take care of the temple that God has given us. But today I want to talk about one of the main spiritual foods to be in heart healthy in Christ because Proverbs 4.23 simply puts it like this, above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. So if you would, grab your Bibles for me and turn to the book of Ephesians, chapter 6, and we're going to focus here on verse 14. But let's go ahead and start back in verse 10. I just want to give you a little bit of context, just in case you've not been with us, so you can understand what Paul has already said up to this point. So Ephesians chapter 6, and let's start here in verse 10. It puts it like this, finally. Be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you've done everything to stand, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist with the breastplate of righteousness in place. Now, do you see that, that key word there, breastplate of righteousness? In our culture, this, this word has almost been given a little bit of a negative connotation, especially when we say someone is self-righteous. That means that they're a snooty toot who walks around like they're all that in a bag of chips, giving off this holier-than-thou persona, when in fact it doesn't resemble biblical righteousness at all. But today, I hope we can kind of grasp this godly attribute that's designed to protect our hearts. And listen, there are two sides to righteousness. And first is God's righteousness. God's righteousness. So if you're a note taker, 
Uh, and you can always go to our outline at fccgreensburg.com and you can see that. You can also go to uh, the YouVersion Bible app, uh, go to events, go to our church, and you can see it that way. But here's the first thing I want you to see today. Righteousness is embraced, not earned. Righteousness is embraced, it's not earned. See, this is a hard concept for people like me, maybe people, someone like you, who may have been raised with this mentality that nothing in life is free, so won't you go earn it? Pick yourself up by your own bootstraps, right? Work for everything you have. And listen, I was raised this way. And I'm all for people with drive and determination, not letting anything hold them back. I'm glad I was raised this way because we're becoming more and more a culture of excuse makers rather than people who can overcome adversity. So I'm not saying that this bootstrap mentality is wrong across the board, but it can't be helpful at all uh, when it comes to your walk with Jesus. It doesn't work this way. You can't earn your salvation. The Bible is clear that one sin separates us from a holy and righteous God. The perfection it would take for you and I to earn our way to heaven is long gone because we've sinned. We've missed that perfect mark, that perfect standard of righteousness. Do you remember walking through the Ten Commandments here at the church just a few months back and realizing that you and I have broken about every single one of these when you think about Jesus' words as well? But the greatest news that you'll ever hear is that God loved us so much that he made a way for us to be made righteous. See, here's what 2 Corinthians 5.21 says. God made him, talking about Jesus, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. See, God in the flesh came to this earth in the most unexpected of ways. Born as a fragile baby to ordinary blue-collar people, grew in wisdom and stature, never sinned, not even once, began his ministry teaching about the kingdom of God, performing signs and miracles and wonders. And because he interrupted the religious agenda and power hierarchy, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, those are the religious leaders of the day, they came after him. He was lied about, he was mistreated, conspired against, and arrested. He endured false witness, mocking, a crown of thorns, what they called 40 lashes minus one, and he was forced to carry his own cross to Golgotha. And there they put nails in his hands, in his feet, attaching him to the boards, hoisted him up, and dropped the base into a hole causing agonizing pain. He suffered, saved a thief, asked the Father to forgive those crucifying him, and breathed his last breath, taking your sin and mine upon his shoulders. Then some of his secret followers became public. They placed his body in a tomb, and then for the rest of Friday, all day Saturday, and into Sunday morning, which the Jewish culture calls three days, his body lay life until, <laughs> until the grave could hold him no longer. Death is strong, but life is stronger. And he came busting out of that tomb, appearing to roughly 500 people, showing that death has been defeated. There is life everlasting in Christ Jesus. And if that doesn't uplift your heart, then there needs to be some real spiritual CPR because you have flatlined. We're losing them. Now, if I can get all theological on you for a moment, this is called imputed righteousness or justification. If you by faith have repented of your sins, confessing him, as your Lord and Savior, surrendering all of you to all of Him according to His Word, being baptized into Christ like the Word teaches, then you have been made right. The righteousness of Christ has replaced your unrighteousness and covers you as a child of God. See, when God the Father looks at you, if you are a believer in Christ, when He looks at you, it's as if you've never sinned. Now, we know we've sinned, right? But it's as if 
We've never sinned because Christ's righteousness, His perfect sinless life, His death on the cross covers us. His blood covers us. We've done nothing to deserve it. We can't serve enough in ministry. We can't give enough to the church. Christ's righteousness is placed over us like a blanket. My friends, that's called grace. And yes, it's amazing. Philippians 3, starting here in verse 8, puts it like this. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to... I consider everything a loss, he says, because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage or rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. The righteousness, listen to this, that comes from God on the basis of faith. So when we talk about putting on the breastplate of righteousness, listen, you can't do it if you're not covered by the blood of Jesus that washes away our sins, that makes us as white as snow before our God. As much as it goes against our grain, we embrace the righteousness that covers us as followers of Jesus. See, Randy Alcorn, a well-known Christian author, he put it this way. He said, in Christianity, men gain righteousness only by confessing their unrighteousness and being covered by Christ's merit. Every other religion, he says, is man working his way to God. Christianity is God working his way to men. So church, if you want to be spiritually heart healthy, it starts by coming all in to Jesus, being clothed in his righteousness, forgiven of every sin, walking in that freedom. And then the second thing I want you to see today, Christ's righteousness transforms us from the inside out. I know that's a long sentence there. Christ's righteousness transforms these hearts from the inside out. Now listen, I know that we will never be perfect on this side of eternity. But when your sins are forgiven, when you've been filled with the Holy Spirit, when you've been given this kingdom purpose, it changes everything. It has to. Or we got to go back and say, okay, am I truly all in with Jesus? Guys, I'll never forget the first church that I went to as a new believer, and I have so many fond memories of, uh, of the pastors there and just how they loved me and poured into me. But they would hold up their Bible every week. And they would hold it up like this, and they would say, this is God's word. Every word is true. Every promise I can claim as my own, I will never be the same. Amen. Now, the same thing's true when I've been clothed in Christ's righteousness. Transformation, growth, maturity, whatever you want to call it, it always happens. Godly fruit is always a byproduct of true salvation in Jesus. Now, the word righteous in this context simply means right living according to the Word of God. Instead of imputed, like we talked about a few minutes ago, this is called imparted righteousness. This is the process of walking in the assurance of your salvation while also working out your salvation at the very same time. And it is possible. So this is the big theological word, sanctification. The process, I'm going to keep this simple because you know that I am not a person of big words. The process of growing in righteousness and holiness, trying to look more like Jesus every single day. See, Proverbs 13, 6 teaches us that righteousness guards the person of integrity, but wickedness overthrows the sinner. So it's safe to say that wrong living invites the enemy in. You are opening up your heart and giving him a free shot, but right living is the breastplate of righteousness that protects, covers, guards your heart in Christ Jesus. I want to show you a picture here, and I want to see if you know what this is. How many of you, without searching the internet, 
Know what a catchy, K-A-T-C-H-Y, you know what a catchy is off the top of your head. Let me ask you a different question. How many of you have ever let a potato or a banana or some other fruit or vegetable go bad and then you have these little gnat flies all around you, these fruit flies, whatever they're called, right? But this drives me crazy. And yet my wife, who also loves a clean home and does a fantastic job, but my wife loves to make banana bread. And the way I've always seen it done is you let them go rotten and then you, you know, put them in the ingredients and you make banana bread. And I can't stand though, although I love banana bread, I can't stand coming home and feeling like my house has these dirty little flies all over the place. So if you took this catchy and you plugged it in, the UV light would attract those bugs and they would stick to those little pads that are on the inside. And let's say you were going to make banana muffins when you got home from work. So before you left, you plugged in the catchy. Do you think that your kitchen would be completely fruit fly free when you got home? Uh-uh. <laughs> the catchy works. The sticky pads would be full, but it doesn't matter if it's on all the time or not because this pesky little enemy is going to keep coming in until you get rid of that rotten fruit in your life. Church, as disciples of Jesus who stand spotless before the throne only because of Christ's righteousness, we are called to pursue right living by the power of the Holy Spirit. James chapter 4 actually puts it like this, starting here in verse 7. I love this passage. James 4, 7 and 8 says this, Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Come near to God, and he will come near to you. And then he gets pretty strong here, but it's okay. He says, wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. In other words, live for Jesus. Don't have one foot in with Jesus and one foot out. Be all in. Now, I was listening to a message by a great preacher out of Florida named Aaron Burke. And he gave a fantastic illustration of this. Apparently, the house he lives in has two, maybe three floors. But the main floor is the common area. And they have like a living room, a kitchen, a bathroom, sitting area, maybe the master bedroom. And that's the part of the house that if you were to walk into probably about any time, it's going to be very clean. It's going to be picked up. It's going to look nice. The second floor is where the kids' bedrooms are. And Aaron said that when people come over, they will often say, wow, you guys keep your house very nice and clean. He said it's because they don't go to the second floor. They haven't looked under the kids' beds or in the closet where the kids just shove all their junk when they've been told, uh-uh, don't do that. You got to clean your entire room. But instead, what do sometimes kids do? They shove it all in the closet. And then he brought the heat. He said, church, listen. He said, don't just act like a Christian, be one. Don't just appear good, be righteous. He said, Jesus didn't come to help us manage sin and move it around to different places. He came to give victory over sin. Church, how often do we just manage our sin? Like he's talking about there. Like, like, the, like the, the mess in the kids' rooms where we don't really deal with it and clean up. We just push it around to different closets in the house to appear a certain way around certain people at a certain time. And listen, the same Jesus who saves us, lavishes His grace on us by His mighty power, is the same Jesus who sanctifies us and wants to grow us in him every day because the more we pursue the heart of God the more we pursue the righteousness of Christ and are covered by that the more you'll discover that the things of this world will never satisfy in the first place there's nothing like an intimate walk with Jesus where the things of this world will fade and the fruits of the Spirit will take over and you get to walk in the purpose that you were created for See Ephesians chapter 4, starting in verse 22, actually puts it like this. Ephesians 4, verse 22. 
It says, you were taught with regard to your former way of life to put on, or actually to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitudes of your minds, and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Now, I don't stand here today before you trying to act like I'm perfect or that I have it together or I am the perfect example of everything we've talked about today because, listen, I don't have it all together. If you want to find fault in me, you'll find it, just like I could find it in you. I battle the enemy every day, and sometimes I lose that battle. I have my own struggles, my own insecurities, and my own sins that are trying to always bring me down. But I do stand before you as someone who is sincere and wanting my life to look more like my Savior every day. I stand before you as someone who God has done a great work in over the last 23 years, although I am definitely still a work in progress. And I've been deeply convicted lately that we, the church, look way too much like the world. See, we can't talk like the world. We can't dress like the world. Come on, church. We can't date and do relationships just like the world. We can't treat our spouse like the world treats theirs. We can't seek revenge like the world. We can't handle our money or chase after materialism like the world. We can't pursue fame and popularity and power like the world. We can't run our businesses or perform our jobs like the world. We can't treat those around us like the world either. We as children of God have been called out of darkness into the glorious light of Christ. And it's this pursuit to to live like Jesus, to walk in accordance with the calling that we have in Christ. That pursuit of righteousness guards my heart and it protects me from the enemy's attacks. Even since the enemy fleeing, from us, just like we just read a second ago. See Romans chapter 6, starting in verse 1, actually puts it like this. It says, What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? In other words, I mean, a lot of people live this way, and we all can fall into this if, if we're not careful and if we don't walk intimately with Jesus and have that relationship But how many people come to church, get baptized into Christ, surrender their hearts to Him, but they never truly even have a desire to live for Him and walk in Him and be righteous in Him every day? He says, shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? And then he says, by no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it? Any longer, Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? He said, we were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. Church, the best way to get spiritually healthy spiritually heart healthy, the best spiritual food that we can consume is to make, the, to, that makes the enemy flee, is first realizing what Jesus has done on the cross and embracing Christ's righteousness, walking by faith, surrendering all of me to all of him for all of my life according to all of his word. And while it's hard to fathom that we as believers stand before the Father faultless, apart from our own merit, we can praise our Savior that His righteousness covers us like a blanket. And then, out of worship and eternal thankfulness, we choose to walk in righteousness as daily we are being transformed more and more into His image. I want to leave you with this simple passage today. Jesus' words what we call the Beatitudes from Matthew chapter 5, verse 6. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Listen to this, for they will be filled. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, uh, thank you so much 
for just opening up your word to us today. We thank you for just your amazing grace. We thank you for what you did on the cross that saves us, that, that, that redeems us. And it's not by my works. It's not by my own merit. It's not by something I've done or being a preacher or anything else that saves me. It's only by your death on the cross and your resurrection from the dead and our faith that we place in you, Lord. That's the only thing that sets us free and saves us. We worship you. We adore you. We thank you for this amazing grace. And Father, right now, we just pray that that grace will be the motivator to live a life worthy of the calling that we have received, that we will walk in you, growing in you every day, looking more and more like Jesus. So Lord, take our hearts, make us more like you, we pray. In Jesus' holy and precious name we pray, amen and amen. Hey, thank you so much for tuning in today. Once again, my name is Ray Sweet from First Christian Church, Greensburg, Indiana. And I just want to give you this invitation today. Maybe God was using this message to stir your heart and using his words to just soften things up, to draw you to himself. Maybe you just have some faith questions. Here's a couple ways that, that we can help you with that. We would love to come alongside you just like others have done for us. So please reach out to us. You can do that in a couple different ways. Our phone number here at the church is 812-663-8488 or you can go ahead and email me at ray at fccgreensburg.com. Hey, God bless you. Hope you have a great week.